House floor. Because of technical problems, we joined the meeting already in progress, following statements by several House members who are testifying before the committee. Uh, let me, uh, before I go any further, just uh, call attention to a birthday that's taken place with one member of this, uh, this panel uh, today. Uh, Mr. Joe Moakley wanted to uh, sing a Boston accent version of Happy Birthday, but I overruled that. Uh, it is Mr. Quillen's birthday today, though. Jim, Jim, how old are you? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry Solomon. I yield to the Chairman Demeritus for a moment. I thank you, Jerry Solomon. I, you know, I almost forgot it was my birthday. <laughs> On purpose. Isn't it wonderful to be 19 years old? <laughs> but you can add 60 to that. This is my 79th birthday. Thank you, Jerry Hall. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Happy birthday. <laughs> let, let me just say to the panel um, that uh, I think the most uh, significant statement made here today was the fact that this is, and I can't remember which one of you said it, but it is uh, not a partisan issue outside of the Beltway. And uh, that is so, so very, very true. Uh, I have a number of questions which, um, if it's all right with you gentlemen, we can uh, not take up the time of the committee, but I would like to give them to you that you can uh, give, them, uh, give us the answers back. And uh, let me just get into one, one issue, and that is the question of the second rule. And of course, uh, a lot of people outside of the Beltway don't understand what that means, but the truth of the matter is that uh, over the years, uh, the House of Representatives has, uh, on a regular basis, waive the rules of the House. We have waived the rules uh, concerning the Budget Act, and maybe that's how we got ourselves into this fiscal mess that we're in uh, today. Uh, we have waived points of order on a regular basis, and uh, what we want to do is to enforce the fact that if we are going to waive a point of order, it's going to have to stand on its own, and individual members of the House of Representatives are going to have to, to cast a vote to waive that point of order on section, what is it, section 425 uh, that deals with unfunded mandates. That way, every member is going to have to stand uh, and be counted back home. And uh, uh, I have some reservations about um, uh, the cumbersome way this would have to be implemented. But nevertheless, I think it's imperative if we're going to put any teeth into this piece of legislation and make Congress accountable. So I yield to my good friend, Mr. Klinger. Well, I appreciate the, the chairman's uh, um, comments on this, and we really are very grateful for his support of this. I think, as we've indicated in our testimony, the objective here is to ensure an up or down vote on, on whether or not we go forward with a mandate that is unfunded. And I think that is the, the objective we're trying to achieve, and it is a somewhat of a convoluted procedure to get there. Uh, but this will ensure uh, a clear vote on whether or not the mandate should be imposed uh, without the funding. And I think the, the other point that uh, Mr. Portman made is, you know, what we're really seeking here, first of all, is to get good cost estimates of what these things cost. Right. I mean, that is the, the, uh, the bottom line, is trying to figure out what do they cost, what are we really imposing on people. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you gentlemen. At this point, let me yield to the uh, Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Quillen of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I've always felt that we needed to do away with the mandates to our states. And I think this is a great uh, procedure to accomplish that goal. I appreciate uh, your all being here. I'm sorry I didn't hear all the testimony, but I certainly support uh, the legislation. Last year, I co-sponsored some of the bill, and I'm delighted to be a, a supporter. Thank you very much. And uh, just just point out again, uh, Mr. Klinger, as you brought out, uh, and I did on my opening uh, statement, that uh, uh, our jurisdiction is in Title III. And although we may have some statements to make about other titles, uh, I would hope that the members could uh, concentrate on Title III that we will have to mark up tomorrow uh, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning. And having said that, let me yield to my good friend, the ranking minority member, Mr. Moakley. Uh, on, in section 424C and D. Put your microphone on, Joe. I, I thought you were used to my voice by now, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In section 424 C and D, both seem to require views of 
Committees regarding proposed legislation having budget impact on states or local governments. And I'm just wondering how they are different and, and do we need both C and D? Any, that's for anybody out there. That's on page 39, I'm sorry. 39 and 40. Yeah. Chairman, are you referring to the private sector, public sector distinction? Uh, no, it's the uh, uh, it's it's to require views of committees regarding proposed legislation having impact on states or local governments. One is, one is on private sector. I, it looks like they're both on private sector. That's, that's why I want to know, is, uh, is there something I'm not seeing in here? I am advised, Mr. I'm advised by staff that there is a drafting error and that there, there was a, the intent, I think, was to differentiate between the private sector views and estimates and the, and the estimates that would apply to uh, state and local government. Your mic up. Well, Bill, would you repeat that? Your mic wasn't on, just so we can... Uh, it, 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 it reads and is redundant error. right now, which yeah. I think is a good question. It was meant to differentiate between the public and private sectors right. in the two different sections. Right. That's the objection. Good, good point. Okay. Now, you say you want to go through uh, a two-step process uh, on the point of order to make it clear that the vote is only on the unfunded mandate point of order. The second rule does not have to be limited to only that point of order. In fact, you could include the waiver of the two-thirds vote, as Mr. Condor talked about. Uh, there could be others, uh, and there's no guarantee that there will be charity in the second rule. We, we just don't know what the hell would be in the second rule. Well, yeah, I, I, I think what we're trying to do is just guarantee that we get a vote. And I, I, that's basically what... Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Uh, we just want we just want some accountability that each that members on the floor have the opportunity to cast a vote. My preference is it be a three fifth to waive the point of order, but that may not be the wishes of this committee. But that's my preference. No, but I'm saying on the second rule, it won't be limited to unfunded mandates. That you can put other things into that second rule. Well, if the uh, if the ranking member would yield. Uh, uh, by by putting this into the uh, into the statute, it requires a second rule, in order to allow us in the rules committee to waive that point of order. That was part of my concern because it takes away some of the power uh, of the rules committee. But nevertheless, we are willing to give up that power because it is so terribly important. And the fact of the matter is, the second rule will simply make it in order for us to waive the rule. Uh, which we will not be able to do. But I, I think the, I may be wrong again, uh, because I, I just looked at the thing in the cursory fashion, but uh, uh, does it actually refer to the second rule, uh, or, or is it just by... Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman? Yes. M maybe, yeah. maybe you want to make an exclusive rule that it only deals with, I mean, that's your area of review well, today. You could make it right. exclusive, and we'd certainly, I don't think yeah. there's any opposition. No, I, I just yeah. want to know if it... We uh, mentions the second no, rule, uh, 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 yeah. just the way we do business yeah. up here. That's uh, all. It, it is I'm implied. I'm trying to change that a little bit. Yeah, it, it is implied, okay. and I don't know that we would want to uh, want to get into making it exclusively. Uh, certainly, in order for us to bring it to the floor uh, and waive a point of order, we have to have the second rule. It is implied, and that would certainly be the intent of the legislation. Well, that was my we question: would... whether it was implied or right. whether it was designated. It is implied. Now. There's a requirement here that the chair has to look to the government reform committee for final determination on the legislative language. Isn't that kind of unusual? No. It's not? Sure. No, they, have, they have to okay our, they, our basically, rule. The provision of that is, is to rest final authority someplace to, if there is dispute over what is or is not a mandate. There has to be a final resolution at some point as mm -hmm. to whether there is a mandate or not a mandate. In our version, we do uh, we do rest that authority in the government reform and oversight committee. 
Um, my understanding is in the other body that is not the case, but in, in our in the, in the Senate version, it's ambiguous, and I think right. it's got to be dealt with, and that's why it should be in here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there has and to it, be. But it would be something we process. can conference later that's on. Right. But as, I mean, as the gentleman pointed out, we have defined what an unfunded mandate is, and, and hopefully uh, that would cover uh, most of the instances. There may be uh, times when that will not be as clear, in which case we best. Uh, but isn't it the, the speaker or the uh, chairman of the committee of the House that makes this determination whether a point of order <coughs> lies in a parliamentarian is. Well, okay. I'd just like to read the rest of it and maybe we'll just add to it. Uh, what does final determination mean? What happens if the presiding officer of the House disagrees? Is that binding on the chair? Uh, and I don't see any language in the bill uh, pertaining to that. A parliamentarian's decision is, is binding on the chair under all circumstances. Now, I'm just saying if the for, House For good or bad. If the House disagrees, what happens? Mm -hmm. Well, they can, they, can, they can overrule and appeal the, uh, the ruling of the That's chair. But the Speaker is bound to follow the parliamentary decisions because he is the Speaker of the House for both sides. Thank goodness. How much reasoning ability uh, are you seizing from the Chairman of the Committee of the whole of the speaker, uh, because the chair and his rulings are supposed to be independent, uh, following the rules and precedents of the House. Uh, do I understand that you're going to uh, take some of the precedents away? Is that absolutely not? Nothing about precedents. Ab absolutely not. Okay. I think we have to. Uh, uh, we we've lived with the presidents of the House. It's served this country well. It's served this body well, and uh, yeah. we should certainly continue to follow it. All right, I have no other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and let me yield uh, to my good friend, the Subcommittee Chairman on Rules, Mr. David Dreyer of Claremont, California. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me uh, congratulate the panel and just underscore a couple of points that were made uh, by virtually all of you, and I think uh, were pointed out once again by the correction that the ranking member just made and pointing to a problem on page 39 of the bill. This clearly has been a bipartisan effort, and Tom, while you said the uh, bipartisanship extends beyond the beltway. It seems to me that Mr. Moakley's uh, correction that he's just made here has demonstrated his willingness to try and improve uh, this legislation. And it seems to me that as we look at the people whom we uh, are privileged to represent here, uh, liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans alike in the uh, cities that I represent in the Los Angeles area, which are suffering now from terrible rains, have regularly brought to my attention the issue of unfunded mandates. And uh, we have tried, I've worked with, uh, with Gary and with Rob and others for a long period of time to try and move something here, and Bill has done a, a terrific job. I think that we've got a, a wonderful opportunity to bring about accountability, and I think this legislation does just that. And uh, it seems to me that as we seek accountability, the issue that was just raised uh, by Joe Moakley uh, with you is a very important one, Bill, because uh, we need to have an arbiter in this thing. And it seems to me that the Government Reform and Oversight Committee is the natural spot for that to take place. Why? Because you all are accountable, and others who might be arbiters are not accountable to the people as you are. So I think that this is a, a very worthwhile piece of legislation, and I uh, am very, very pleased that this is the first measure that we're moving out of our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. At this point, let me yield to another Californian, uh, Tony Bielinson. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And the folks who are up here today are to be commended for their, for their hard work on this, on this issue. It is an important one, and I must, I must say the fact that there's a particularly thoughtful group here before us is, is reassuring to me and I'm sure to many of my, my colleagues, especially on, on our side of the aisle. Obviously, the, the goals of this, of this legislation and, and similar efforts in the, in the past is extremely worthwhile. And the, and the questions only come, questions only arise with respect to the, to the specific uh, effects that it, that it will have, many of, of which perhaps may well be unintended or at least unthought of at this particular time, and how in practice it, it actually will work out. And hopefully we'll have some further testimony with respect to that from some of the witnesses later on. And undoubtedly, I guess, Mr. Chairman, you must have had some uh, yesterday. I must say parenthetically that I share some of my former chairmen, my our ranking members' concerns about you're giving this um, uh, enough time to, to answer all of these questions thoroughly. 
this is obviously the kind of um, complicated piece of legislation which is going to continually uh, create problems and, and questions as as it's implemented, you know, as, as the years go by. And I just want us to, want all, all of us, while understanding that we're going to pass this bill or something very similar to it in the very near future, spend as much time as is necessary to try to figure out in advance of passing the legislation just exactly how it will work and what its what its effects will be, because it obviously has far far-ranging effects, and we just have to be as careful as possible. Obviously, efforts, similar efforts have been made in the past. There was a bill last year, 5128, I think, which I guess never saw the light of day, although it may have escaped from the old Government Operations Committee. I'm not sure. But in any case, it didn't come to the floor. I take it this bill is somewhat different from that bill. Can you, is it quite different? I mean, is this an entirely new animal? Well, it's, it's not an entirely new animal. We've incorporated much of what was in the uh, previous legislation into the uh, current draft. It is a stronger bill in our view and it, it the, really the point of order I take it is the point is of order is, is a uh, is a provision that I think was not in the previous bill there were requirements uh, of estimates I take it in the previous right. bill similar right. bill, yes. similar to this 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 uh, does have uh, stronger teeth but I would emphasize again this is not a no money no mandate bill I think that uh, was concerned people that we were really if we did that we were really going to hamstring people I know Gary <laughs> would like to have seen it well uh, no I, money, no mandate. if I may Mr. Chairman yeah. I, it, yeah. this does require you to come up with some money for funding I, I make no mistake about it. It is a stronger version than last year. In my opinion, it ought to be stronger than it was last year. Last year's was too weak. But this requires you to come up with some funding. And I think that's an important element of this. Just making a financial statement is uh, important, but you've got to then come up with some money to fund the mandates. So. Which was not in last year's bill. Yeah, the, the difference is that uh, you have to, last year we had, the money had to be authorized. This year it has to actually be provided. <laughs> there has to be a, a definite provision for the money. Uh, in the last year's bill, we just uh, said that the, the money needed to be authorized, but not uh, necessarily appropriate. Mr. Bielson, let me just, on, sure. on, the, on that point, uh, it is a stronger and I think a better bill. I think it works better also. Uh, under our old bill, we had a problem, of course, that the authorizing committee might do one thing, but then the appropriation committee would choose not to, not to fund a mandate. And under this provision, uh, which can always be overruled by a majority vote uh, in, in the House, uh, the mandate would not become effective unless the funds were appropriated. Uh, this is a, a way in which to get at the appropriation problem without applying a point of order to the appropriations bill, which we thought uh, would unduly tie up the system. Thanks, Rob. Mr. Chairman, is it right if I ask a few more questions? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Davis and, and Mr. Klinger, I think the chairman, were talking before about reauthorization bills and how, if in effect they were basically a, a, a strict reauthorization bill without any, without any increases in them, they would not be subject to this piece of legislation because it's not new, because it's not new legislation. To the extent that a, reauthorizing, that a reauthorized bill, some environmental bill, let's, let's take it as an example, uh, increases the standards or or somehow increases the requirements, I suppose, for, for costs at some local or state level, even though it's basically a reauthorization of some existing law, I take it that incremental cost of those additional standards would have to be funded under this bill, or at least the point of order would apply under only those circumstances. Only if it exceeds the threshold. In other words, only if the impact was uh, $50 million or right. more uh, but, nationwide. But okay. But presumably, if it's, a nation, if it's a bill which applies nationwide, it would. But it would apply, but, but the, the provisions of this new bill Bill would um, would apply only only to those incremental yeah, exactly things, only not to, to the, not to the basic not to the basic. Uh, in other words, our intent was not to in any way undercut or uh, or water down whatever we have whatever is okay. okay. Thank you. A couple more questions, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the bill acknowledges that it may not, and I think I'm using the words of the bill, <clears throat> may not be quote feasible to make a reasonable estimate, and the CBO director may issue a statement to that effect. What does one do then? Uh, what's the status, for example, of the point of, of, of order against new or expanded federal mandates in the absence of a, of a CBO estimate? And, and how can you then um, ask the Budget Committee or anybody else to make a, an es such an estimate if the CBO itself has, has, has already said that they don't think it's feasible to do so? Where, where are we then? That provision uh, applies only to the private sector analysis that the, uh, that the CBO says they are not able to estimate the effect on the private sector, then uh, so it would not apply across the board. It's only the private sector area, and therefore the, the point of order would not lie. Now, the point of order lies only with respect, does not lie with respect to the private sector, is that correct? correct. Only with respect to state and local governments. So your answer to that is that 
that the point of order is not involved in this particular instance because the, the non-feasibility phrase refers only to private to the private sector. The ob objective here is to get a, a good idea of what the costs are going to be. In some instances, the CBA may, CBO may indicate that it's impossible or extraordinarily difficult for them to arrive at that, but the, that does not involve the point of order. Okay. Um, several factors seem to, to make it likely that it is going to be difficult to get at times reliable estimates of federal mandate costs. That's obvious and you're all, you're all quite a, you know, aware of that. Legislation is often, is often drafted r relatively uh, broadly. Uh, direct costs uh, to the extent that they can be determined at, at, at all are likely to vary widely from state to state and from locality to locality, making broad generalizations uh, difficult. And further, and perhaps most important and most potentially troubling, um, obtaining accurate information from states and localities on a timely basis, which seems to be necessary or essential for the CBO to make any decent kind of estimates, may be difficult. Uh, what do we do then? Or how do we, uh, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't, we don't want it to, to obstruct the process, and obviously you're reaching out in all the right ways to try to find ahead of time, if at all possible, we know what the cost of these mandates are, but what if, uh, first of all, some of the information is going to be difficult to come by, and in some instances you're not going to be able to get it at all if, if local governments don't, don't respond to you. How do we, what do we do then? Just make the best possible guess and, and move ahead? I, I think you work I'm with not, national I'm not being critical. I'm no, just trying I, to... No, a good question, a good practical question in terms of how right. you implement it. Uh, I think you go with the national organizations who've done that in the past, where they would do surveys and can help. Uh, you'll get some input on that. It may not be as accurate as... Uh, when you say national organization, Tom, what do you uh, mean? NATO, national... the Governor's Association, this, okay. this kind of groups. They could do a survey. They could take... Uh, uh, you know, look at it from that And your experience is that they've, that they've done a pretty good job with respect they to those kinds of They do a pretty good job. Estimates. You don't get 100 percent, but you, right. get, uh, you get a ballpark. Sure. Well, yeah, that quickly. The, the purpose of a lot of the provisions of this bill are to provide new incentives. And one of the new incentives in here, of course, is for state and local government to provide that information. Before and if they don't, that's their problem. It's their sense. problem. The okay. authorizing committees are now required to consult with them, and then the ball sh uh, shifts to, to their court. And I think what you found, uh, you know, the, the groups uh, such as NACO that Tom was involved in have newsletters periodically that come out with new mandates and so on, with new cost uh, estimates. State of Ohio has done a lot on that already, as of other states. So I think they are. Uh, uh, they have every incentive now to get involved in this process and to let people know. Just a couple more questions, if I, if I may, Mr. Chairman. There are any number of them, and I don't mean to hold this up. It's just, it's an interesting bill, and it's going to be enacted into law in one form or another, and we just need to make sure as, as we possibly can that it works as well as possible and that we can answer some of these questions that ahead of time, if at all possible. Why are we exempting the um, Appropriations Committee from the enforcement provisions of the bill? Do we know? Well, there are a few problems with putting a point of order on appropriations bills. One, of course, uh, uh, is that the appropriators don't like it much. But uh, more importantly, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, Mr. Bielensen, you have a huge appropriation bill for um, a couple or a few, few billion dollars, um, and you have one small unfunded mandate. Uh, it's our view that it's very unlikely that that's going to stop such a bill. Um, we've all seen the, the reason for a line item veto and so on that many of us believe in is related to that. So we just don't think it's practical. Uh, uh, it does tie up the process. If you're going to put a point of order on an appropriation bill, uh, our alternative, we think, is better, which is to say to the appropriators, uh, if the money's not there, the mandate uh, will not be implemented. And I think it's a very, very strong and good new improvement in the bill. Uh, I would also say, though, that can always be waived by the same majority vote on that point of order. Okay. I was just, I was just concerned whether we're leaving some kind of a loophole there that, that's, that's too large and that, that some of these mandates might start finding their way toward you know, if that's the best way around the point of order, since it doesn't lie against appropriations bills. Those mandates, of course, would not be enforced unless there was a majority vote by, by Congress to override that yeah. under this bill. In other words, uh, in the process at the authorization level, there has to have been a vote waiving the point of order in order for that mandate later in the process to be implemented. Unless the legislation is written in an appropriations bill. Well, well, there's yeah. always a point of order against yes. uh, uh, legislating. There is yeah. the point of order okay. to be retained. Uh, okay. it's one final question, if I may, just for today at least, anyway. What, what procedures do you envision, Mr. Chairman, the, um, your committee, Committee on Government, Government Oversight and, Re and Reform, whatever its, its new name is, um, using in determining the, uh, the amount of direct costs and whether a measure contains a mandate? Would it be up to the Chairman and his staff? Would it be, up to the, would it be un subjected to, subject to a vote of the entire committee? The Budget Committee, I'm just, again, thinking out loud, the Budget Committee often will send us a little letter written by the chairman himself or herself, uh, mm -hmm. presumably with, with, after consultation with some of the members, you know, that, that a bill 
that's before the Rules Committee does or does not require a, a waiver or, or doesn't need a waiver and so on. How, how do you propose to You're how asking, take uh, this? how we determine, actually we charge the uh, CBO with, with determining what the, uh, what the impact of the mandate would be as to whether it meets the threshold uh, figure or not. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that determination would be dispositive of whether or not they're the, the point of where it would What lie. if you disagree with CBO? I mean, what if you folks really think CBO is wrong, as, as some of us at times do? I mean, are you, are you, an ab are you able to, to make your own independent judgment on this sort of thing? It, it is, the CBO estimate is dispositive of, the, is. Uh, of the issue. Okay. Sure you want that? Sure you want it? Well, I, I think all four of us would entertain any, any alternatives you might have. Uh, one, one of the problems, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Bielenson, is that uh, state and local government, as an example, might overestimate. Uh, uh, we might uh, overestimate. Someone else might underestimate. You need to have an independent arbiter, and CBO is the, the best we can come up with. Yeah. And they have the ability to do it with an additional authorization of four and a half million dollars in this legislation. Mr. Portman makes a very good point. I mean, we recognize that there's a tension here between what what the state and local government may see as a mandate and the cost of that as to what we might see. And our our intent. I mean, I think there's a. I just want incentive. the we to be. I just want the we to be to be we elected officials and not just the CBO. I'm not worried about, um, you know, well, I think uh, as opposed to the state and local Mr. officials Mr. in their Mr. estimates. Mr. Peterson, in the end, this, this particular bill has judicial review, and you could have that come into play if there is well, a, I, I a decision. I understand, Gary. No, that's a, and that's a valid point. I just want to make sure that, that we don't give up our prerogative as elected officials to, to some, you know, staff folks around here in effect, CBO qualified as they are and, and, and nonpartisan and, and straightforward as they try to be. There might be one, one other point that would be useful to make, and that is that there is a requirement for advisory panels uh, in this legislation. In other words, CBO would have to seek the advice of state and local government officials in putting together these estimates. So uh, we think that would lead to, uh, to, to better estimating. And a bias from the point of view of the state and local governments, too. In this, uh, as an, on an, an advisory basis. Yeah. Okay, one, just let me just make one other comment, if I, if I may. Under the bill, federal agents, on the same general subject of, of losing some power ourselves as elected officials, under the bill, federal agencies also may be given authority to reduce programmatic and financial responsibilities of states, localities, and tribal governments to a degree commensurate with the level of federal funding provided. I just raise the question whether such authority should be granted to federal agencies without some further check from us and the legislature as to how they carry out their authorities. If some, if some cutting back on responsibilities is to be required in order to fit in, excuse me, the, you know, the responsibilities and the, and the duties so that they'll, they will be taken care of by the amount of money that we're funding, should, should it not come back to the Congress itself to decide uh, what, what cutting back of, of uh, duties or requirements or responsibilities there should be rather than that than on the part of some federal agency? The authorizing committees would determine that. They, they would be the final uh, uh, I hope so. Anyway. Anyway, these are just these are valid questions, I think, Mr. Chairman, and, and I just hope you and your folks, I, I know you will, will pursue them. Uh, obviously, you will in the years ahead, but I just, I just hope that to the extent possible, we can resolve some of these questions, you know, before the legislation is put in final form to ensure that at least that we ourselves here in the Congress, you know, retain final authority over some of these decisions and they're not left with staff of ours or federal agencies or somebody else. That's all. Gentlemen, you on that point. Of course. I think that... Uh, I think what we've concluded here is that the legislation does, in fact, create that level of accountability. If the CBO were to make some recommendation and members would dispute that, the arbiter is the government reform and oversight. Well, that's not the answer I got, I think, David. I think they said that CBO was, CBO's decision was dispositive. That was the word. Of the cost. Of the cost. But the final arbitration is handled by the Government Reform and Oversight Farm Committee. Uh, arbitration of what kind? Would, would the gentleman yes, yield? Yes, determining whether or not it is, in fact, an unfunded mandate. Yeah, would, would the gentleman yield on that? It's Tony's time. Yeah, yes, yeah because so. actually this goes to uh, Section 425 in the bill, the point of orders section. And I had a question on that uh, because it is unclear. Um, does the chairman of the uh, Government uh, Operations Committee uh, make this determination himself uh, about raising a point of order on the floor, or is this something that is done by the entire committee? Uh, how is this determination made once, once the information is provided, once this is costed out and uh, we know that it uh, reaches the threshold uh, and that it is subject to a point of order? Uh, how does this actually happen? 
uh, on whether to raise a point of order, because as the gentleman knows, sometimes point of orders, uh, points of order are not raised right. on the floor. I think right. the answer I got, I would say to my friend from Texas, is that the, neither the chairman nor the committee itself has much to do with this, that once CBO says that there's a mandate here, that somebody's got to raise the, the point of order. Well, point, raise. Raising I a point of order, of course, is discretionary. I, yeah, of course. I don't think that's the way you answered it, Bill. The, yeah. the point is that the CBO is involved in determining what the cost is. The, the issue of whether there's a mandate or not, however, rests with the committee. It's not with the CBO. The CBO is only the the vehicle for determining what the cost of well, 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 then Mr. So then Frost's question. To be a that, well, then Mr. Frost's question. My question. That, then the committee has the responsibility then of making that decision. Well, well, I would ask though. I would ask Mr. Mr. Klinger, is this something that the uh, that the chairman of the committee would then make a determination of on the floor at the time this came up? Or is, would the committee meet? How would this be handled? I'm, I'm unclear as to whether or not, first of all, whether this is a mandate, and secondly, whether or not the point of order is actually made. Because my, my, my point is that, as we all know, sometimes legislation that is subject to a point of order comes to the floor and no point of order is made. And uh, that is a critical question about who makes that determination of whether or not to raise the point of order. Yeah. No, that's not what. No, I don't believe that's what the bill says. Uh, the the anybody bill. Could, anybody can raise the point of order, but as you say, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be raised. The, the bill says, for the purposes of this section, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight of the House of Representatives or the Committee on Government Affairs of the Senate, as applicable, shall, shall have the authority to make the final determination of whether a bill, joint resolution, amendment, motion, or conference report contains a federal intergovernmental mandate. Now, my question was, is the chairman going to make that determination? Is the full committee going to make that determination? Uh, what happens if in a, something comes up on the floor and you have to have a decision made on the spot? Um, it's not necessarily in the bill, but there's an amendment offered on the floor which would uh, constitute this type of mandate. I'm just wondering about the mechanics of how this is going to operate. Uh, Mr. Frost? Yes. Could I uh, put this in, in some context and then Mr. Klinger can respond to your yes. more specific question? But I think the way this bill would operate is that uh, the example that you state would be extremely rare. In other words, again, we're trying to put in this legislation incentives to do the right thing at the right time. The right time to do it is at the authorizing committee level. If the authorizing committee chooses not to do it, it then knows it's going to be subject to a point of order on the floor. So there will be every incentive for the authorizing committees to do the right thing. Let's say that for whatever reason the authorizing committees don't do it. Uh, it gets through the Rules Committee somehow, and you all don't, don't catch or choose not to, not to take up the issue of, uh, of the unfunded mandate. It gets to the floor, and you, Mr. Frost, raise a point of order. There's an unfunded mandate in here that affects my district of Texas. I know about it. Uh, and then someone has to be the arbiter. Otherwise, uh, you know, th th there's total chaos. Now, if you have a better suggestion, I know we've no, no, I'm just asking it, mechanically. It, but it's in that point at, at which then the chair defers to the government Oversight and Reform Committee, and, and, and Mr. Kling will have a procedure there, but my, my point, I guess, is that it's, it's going to be very rare that we get to that point in the process. I would suggest to the gentleman that if, in fact, that we, we follow the procedures as outlined by Mr. Solomon, the new chairman of this committee, if we follow the procedures and grant open rules as a matter of course, that this will not be so rare. If we grant open rules, any member can stand up on the floor and offer an amendment, which could, in fact, be a mandate. And this, the language in the bill specifically refers to amendments, not just to bills that have come out of committees. Right. Right. And so this may not be so rare if, in fact, we have open rules and if we are going to have a lot of amendments on the floor. That, and my only question is, my, it's just a procedural question. Yeah, it's a, it's At that point, question. is the chairman of the Government Operations Committee going to be the one that stands up on his own and says, yes, this I've consulted with my staff and this constitutes a mandate and I'm going to make a point of order? Or does he have to, have a, does he have to convene his committee uh, and um, have the committee determine whether this is a mandate or not? Yeah. not uh, one, one more point on the amendment. I think that you would have every incentive, as would any other member, to have that amendment scored before you bring it to the floor if you care about the amendment. And that's my only point, that you're not likely to see a situation where it comes uh, naked to the floor. I'll let Mr. Klinger respond. Well, it, it, it all, I, just, I was just asking the gentleman what, how this is going to work. And if it doesn't come up till it's on the floor, one, should, one would believe that it's up to the chairman to make that decision. There's no requirement at that time for him to convene his committee. I'm think. just asking. Okay, because uh, again, I think we have to all understand that we're operating in a different world now. And I take Mr. Solomon at his word that this committee, the Rules Committee, is going, as a matter of course, to grant open rules. 
And yeah. to the extent that we do that, that we grant open rules, uh, all types of things could occur on the floor. And I think we have to look at the language before us and anticipate things that could come up on the floor. I don't think we should close our eyes to those possibilities. Got other comments? And now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Porter Gall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be very brief in the interest of time. I know we have another panel, but um, I think it's uh, very important that we remember that tomorrow we're going to have a markup on this, and a lot of the questioning we're talking about is very technical uh, and rules committee type oriented procedures that we have to get right. And we're certainly going to have plenty of opportunity to do that. We have your wishes well expressed of what you're trying to accomplish, which is the accountability. And something I think we've all talked a lot about, which is the question of deliberative democracy, of having every member the opportunity to express themselves on these things. And certainly that accountability through the vote process you're talking about makes a lot of sense. The other thing I want to say as a former mayor and county chairman, um, having dealt with this problem, is this uh, we're, we're long overdue. And I, I listened closely to the... Uh, remarks, the opening remarks of the distinguished uh, ranking member, Mr. Moakley. Um, and, and I think it's very important that we d know what we are doing for people. We always talk about the wonderful things we're doing for people in federal government. The problem is we sometimes are a little bit uh, less um, uh, applied in what we talk about doing to people. And I think this is going to correct a lot of that. When you start putting a price tag on the action you're going to take and who is going to pay for it, you start sending a very different message. Uh, and I hope we reduce unintended negative consequences. Uh, I believe we will be in a better position if we pass H.R. 5 once we get all of the technicalities that I think our colleagues on the other side have properly raised, uh, disposed of, and I think they are all uh, easily easily dealt with one way or the other. It's a question of clarifying and making the decision. I think we will be in a better position to have the will of the House applied on this and uh, have better accountability. And I, I uh, compliment you all for such a knowledgeable presentation uh, on some of the other issues that have been raised uh, that are not the rules issues, but uh, I congratulate your knowledge on the rules as well. It is a little puzzling. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this time, let me yield to the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Martin Frost. Um, I just have a couple of questions, and I was, was struck by something that uh, Mr. Dreyer uh, said earlier, talking about the floods out in California. Uh, and, of course, we have flooding elsewhere, too, uh, from time to time. Um, a lot of the uh, planning that goes into flood control uh, is not necessarily on a mandated basis. Um, these are uh, flood control grants that local uh, authorities seek uh, that they voluntarily want. I have uh, municipalities in my district that are clamoring at my door all the time, uh, wanting flood control grants, wanting me to contact the Corps of Engineers to try and get uh, a creek uh, widened and deepened. Um, you aren't suggesting, are you, that the, the federal government would then uh, take on those kind of projects on a 100 percent basis rather than a cost-sharing basis as is currently done, are you? The gentleman yield on that point, absolutely not. In fact, I, I think that we need to clarify what we're doing here with this legislation, and that is we are creating an opportunity to enhance the relationship between federal and state and local governments to try and provide an early warning mechanism so that we can deal with these uh, issues. So that's not the goal that we've had at all, Martin. And I appreciate your letting me clarify that. And in fact, uh, Republicans in previous Congresses have uh, taken the position that the local share should be uh, greater the previous, in previous, during previous Republican administrations, as I recall, that rather than an 80-10, 80-20, or a 90-10 sharing, that these should be done on a 50-50 basis. Uh, I recall that during uh, either the Bush or the Reagan administration, that uh, some of that the federal government's uh, share should not be as great as it has been in the past. And I just want to make sure that we aren't reversing that now and suggesting that the federal government's share should be greater on things like flood control and perhaps uh, airport runways and things of that nature. Absolutely not. Mr. Frost, if I yes. may uh, call your attention to uh, page 22 and where we indicate that the term federal intergovernmental mandate uh, would clearly uh, exempt a condition of federal assistance. In other words, uh, anything involved with a grant or a condition on a grant clearly not affected by this legislation. Okay. And I have, I have another question because I'm, I'm just curious about how this operates. Uh, if I understand correctly that one of the other exemptions is uh, enforcing constitutional rights. 
uh, generally this would be civil rights legislation. Um, I realize that uh, this, is, this legislation is drafted to be prospective in nature, that it wouldn't affect any law that is currently on the books, but let me cite as an example a law that Congress passed uh, several years ago, and that's the motor voter law. I don't know if this has come up in this hearing already. Um, is it uh, contemplated that uh, motor voter uh, would be classified as a uh, law affecting constitutional rights and therefore would be exempt from this language? No, no, if it had, I'm just saying that if this legislation had been in effect at the time that we passed the motor voter law, would the motor voter law have been exempt from this legislation? Because this is a very controversial area, as you know, the states it, it is share. a very controversial area. Uh, Mr. Frost, I don't have uh, the, the ability to, uh, to answer it definitively, and we need some constitutional scholars in here probably, but it's my view that it would, it would indeed be an unfunded mandate. Uh, that it would, it would not, not be exempt. <clears throat> That's correct. That voter voter would, would not be. have been exempt from this legislation. It's not clear that that is a civil right, I think, is the, uh, is the or issue. Or a constitutional right. A constitutional right. Well, the right to vote, of course, is, uh, is a constitutional Absolutely, right. Absolutely, and every state and, provides that right. And the question really is because we may well have other legislation affecting the right, the, the right to vote, affecting voter registration or re matters related to voter registration. And this is something that is of uh, some controversy in terms of the state's role. I know it is in the gentleman from California's state, um, and it is in other states too, and I, I'm just seeking some clarification if, uh, if voter registration laws uh, would be exempt, uh, not just the specific motor voter law, but if motor voter registration laws would be exempt from this, uh, uh, from this uh, language, from this uh, legislation. Since you clearly don't, in, if the gentleman, yeah. you, since you clearly don't intend it to be exempt, maybe you ought to think about saying something about but laws affecting registration requirements and so Ooh, uh, on. If, uh, if, if one of you gentlemen would yield, uh, I would object to that because uh, many of us voted against the motor voter bill specifically for that reason, because it was an unfunded mandate and caused tremendous cost to the taxpayers of the state Mr. of New Chairman, York. Mr. Chairman, my only question yeah. is, uh, is, is this legislation written in such a way so that your objection will now be overridden by this legislation? Uh, are, they taking unfunded, are they taking voter registration laws out of the unfunded mandate category by the way they have written this legislation? And there has not been a conclusive answer at this well, point from the panel. We'll let us. Mr. Klinger answer. Let, me, I, let me just respond very briefly. It's, it's uh, the motor voter bill is not a uh, question of whether you have the right or not the right to vote. It's a, it's a, me a method of facilitating uh, the ability to vote. But, so I think that's a different category than whether or not you're really affecting uh, the right to vote, which I think would be a much, uh, would clearly be a... Well, what if there, my, my question then goes to other matters relating to the right to vote. And I, uh, a number of years ago, when I was in a private practice of law in Texas, uh, prior to being elected to Congress, uh, I was involved uh, on, for the plaintiffs uh, on a lawsuit brought on constitutional grounds challenging the Texas voter registration law at that time. Uh, and uh, this was when we did not have a 30-day cutoff, when we had a much longer cutoff. You had to register in January to be able to vote in election in November, and there were some other states that had that too. And uh, that, that law was struck down on, on constitutional grounds. And so that uh, the whole subject of voter registration uh, certainly could be a constitutional issue. And I, I would suggest to you that you may want to clarify uh, in your legislative language or in your report language exactly what your intention is uh, as to voter registration legislation, because um, <coughs> this subject may come up again. Mr. Chairman, may I respond, respond yes, to that? Yes, then we have to go to uh, John Linder Fine. because of press of time. Go ahead, Gary. No, we recognize that. Well, uh, you know, I, I think that Mr. Frost makes a, an excellent point, but I, I think we would have a very strong legal argument that the Constitution says you have a right to vote, but you don't have a constitutional right to register at the DMV. I mean, that's kind of silly. Well, if, 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 if I may, if the gentleman would yield, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a, te a case in Texas long before I was practicing law involving the all-white primary and the right to register to vote. And the courts struck that down as being an infringement on the right to vote. So the very act of being able, the terms and conditions of when you can register and where you can register is something that the courts have recognized uh, as a constitutional right. And I only urge the gentleman at the table 
uh, as they are crafting this legislation, if it is their intention to exempt those kind of laws, they better be very clear because there are a number of court cases involving the right to vote, the terms and conditions surrounding your bill, when you can register, how you register. Um, and my own preference would be that, uh, uh, that they be exempt. Uh, I happen to disagree with the chairman on that, but that's not the issue here. The question is, what does this legislation mean? And uh, are, you, are you clear enough in the way you've crafted this legislation? Well, if I, if I might just um, say that, you know, th there's a difference between a constitutional right to vote and a, a bill or a law which simply facilitates and makes it easier to vote. In my opinion, there's, there's, there's uh, there a clear uh, difference between them. Let me yield. And then we must really go on to John one, Wonder. One very quick point. Uh, uh, first of all, I think we would all uh, entertain that kind of a uh, language change in the, in the report language or, or otherwise. I think it's, it's a good point. But let me make one very important point. If Mr. Frost felt so strongly about that on the floor of the House, he could raise it, and by a majority vote under this legislation, that point of order could be waived. Absolutely. I would only suggest to the gentleman that I am now a member of the minority party, <laughs> and, I'm, uh, and I assume that the votes are on the other side on many of these issues, and I would only urge the members of the majority party to be very clear in drafting their legislation so that there is no question about their legislative intent. Well, Martin, if uh, you and the minority have a good idea, we're going to support you. Let me, let me yield to uh, John Linder of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, was there a discussion or a vote in committee on the 60 percent requirement to waive the point of order? I would tell the gentleman there was no discussion of that, uh, of that provision. Okay. Secondly, I have a question for Tom Davis. Uh, there's going to be testimony shortly that this would prevent us from raising the minimum wage, which I think is a wonderful idea and an anachronistic notion. Uh, how many people do you think in your experience at the national level involvement with counties and cities and things are working for counties and cities at the minimum wage? Well, not in Fairfax. It's hard to say what happened. Not in Fairfax. I don't know what's happened in other areas. Uh, of the country would be impossible for me to say. There may be some summer jobs, that type of thing, where you have kids home from summer or some uh, high school kids summer job programs. It would be that kind of thing. Of course, those are the kind of jobs that are likely to be eliminated if you raise the minimum wage at the same time. But I agree. And isn't it unlikely that very, very many people in this nation are working for government at the minimum wage? I think that's on, not, not a significant percentage. Yeah. I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's move on to uh, Tony Hall of, of Ohio. Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with you. I don't think that this is a partisan issue. I think it's a worthy issue. I think uh, a lot of questions, though, have been raised today about how this thing is going to work. And it seems like it seems like we're putting the cart before we put the before the horse, because it seems, for example, last year when the bill was passed. We weren't contemplating a balanced budget amendment. We weren't thinking about block grants. We weren't thinking about uh, a decrease in taxes. And all of these things, if you put them together, including an increase in defense, how is all this going to play out with a bill like this if we put this bill first? It seems like this ought to come after the 100 days rather than before. It's worthy. But there's a lot of questions that have been raised here just in the past hour or two. I know that states are having a tough time, but aren't we tying our hands on future, on future uh, legislation without having a clue of how, as how it's really is going to, it's going to look? Aren't we tying the hands here? Because, yeah, Rob, Mr. Holt, uh, just a couple of quick comments. Number one, I think this is the best of all worlds uh, in the sense that we're passing this legislation to give the states and localities the kind of security that they need. They'd like even more security, uh, many of them. But this gives them the security they need to then go ahead with the balanced budget amendment. So I think uh, in the logical order, this would naturally come first before we, as the House, take up that issue of the balanced budget amendment. Uh, however, at the same time, the bill is not effective until October 1st. The reason for that is very simple. We think it's going to take that long for us to be able to implement this bill properly to get uh, this committee, the Budget Committee, uh, the Government Affairs Committee, and other committees up to speed on the legislation, the floor, and the parliamentary, and so on. We want it to work. So I think in, in some ways the timing is, is perfect. It's before, as you say, some of the major changes that we're going to be contemplating. I think it's necessary to give the states in particular that kind of comfort. 
uh, and, and yet it's not effective until, <laughs> until October 1st to give us time to get into place the mechanism so it'll work properly. Well, let's take the WIC program, for example. It's a specific program. It's considered probably our finest, one of our finest federal programs that we have. It's not a partisan issue. Um, if we give it to the state and it's exempted with other specific exemptions in the bill, like, for example, probably with food stamps and everything, we take the mandate away. Well, let me, let me, let me ask this question. If, if we exempt WIC, isn't, because it's such an important program, isn't it like the constitutional and civil rights and national security reasons isn't, isn't as important to fight for this and infant mortality rates as some of the other things that we're exempting? Well. Uh, the, uh, as we've indicated, the WIC program uh, is an existing program. It would not be affected by the, uh, this bill under the block, it is an but existing uh, authorized program and <coughs> therefore is exempt uh, from but the But if, if you folded in, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, if you folded in to the block grant program, as I understand that we are, along with the food stamp program, you take the mandate away, what you're doing is you're passing the buck, you're pushing the responsibility on the states and the local government to now be in the food business, nutrition business, you're taking the mandate away and you're saying for them, you know, divide it up, divide up the resources. Now, as a, Mr. Davis, as a, as a local county executive and, and many of the people served in local governments, <clears throat> if you have to decide what kind of program you're going to go for as far as nutrition programs or economic development or building a bridge or high visibility things, nutrition programs and poverty programs are the last thing that you're gonna that you're gonna decide upon. What's gonna happen is is that I think the WIC program, the block ant program, all of those things are gonna take the short end of the stick. But we don't know because we're putting the cart before we put the horse. We're, we're we're putting what we're doing is we're passing this and we don't know what's gonna happen with the block ant program. So what you're doing is you're gonna force you're gonna pass the buck onto the states and local government. You're now going to make them experts on nutrition and local programs. It's not a mandate. And why are you doing this? Because at the same time, what's going to happen? They're going to come back upon us, and there's going to be the question. You're going to re require more reports. But the, the problem with it is you're going to demand that they become experts in nutrition. There's going to be less of a pie. And isn't... Well, let me just respond. That, that one of the reasons that we're doing it now is because this is a this is a vital concern to the states and local governments. I mean, really, this is in response to their very strongly urged uh, request that we consider this legislation now before we move to a constitutional amendment to balance the budget, because they're concerned that that those costs will be forced back on them. So. Uh, this is really in response to their initiative that we are undertaking this. I think it's, it's, it would be difficult for us to, to prognosticate what may or may not happen to existing programs. But I think that in terms of assuring the state and local governments that we're not going to be uh, overloading them in the future, uh, this is important. If the gentleman would yield. Uh, Tony, you know, I, I, I sort of think it's the other way around. You know, first of all, uh, states have departments of health, departments of human resources, and they have more expertise than we have in Washington uh, by a long shot. Now, let's just go back to um, in the early 80s. We had all kinds of categorical grant programs in education, and we were micromanaging the educational system throughout this country, we from Washington. And what we did, if you recall, in 81 and 82, we wiped out those categorical grant programs. We turned them into a block grant, similar to what we're talking about here. We gave the money to the state of New York or the state of Ohio, and then we mandated that 80% of that money be passed on to the local school districts so they could establish their own curriculum based on their needs. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. You really are, are not passing any buck. You are giving them the ability to decide what their priorities are. In Wyoming, the priority would not be so much for WIC as it would be in New York or Ohio. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, 
I'd be glad to yield to the gentleman. Um, it is necessary for us to pass this legislation before we move on to any additional reforms. You will not have welfare reform and other reforms that um, cause great change among local governments because state governors will absolutely go bananas if they believe we're going to do right. welfare reform and other reforms without relieving them of unfunded mandates. We're, we're going to hold ourselves. This has got to be done first. We've got to assure local governments, whatever reforms we do here in the House, that we're not going to put the burdens back on local governments. And then, in addition to that, you, you, you have the opportunity, even with this bill, to take any program, any issue you want to the floor and make a convincing argument that we ought to continue this. But when you do that, you have got to fund it. You can't pass on the responsibility to someone else. So we're not taking people's options away from them. They can go to the floor and convince the rest of us that it's a great program, it has merit, but we have got to pass this or we will not get to the additional reforms that need to be done in this House. Well, I am concerned about, you know, these unfunded mandates, for example. I'm concerned about if you put, as there is a bill right now, all these block grants into one program, and then you make the, state, the states decide whether they want to fund it or not, they can, they can back out of it because it's now not a mandate. And what happens is, as you listen to the city of mayors, you know, we, we have the food stamp program, we have nutrition programs, we have school feeding programs, we have the WIC program. They're wonderful programs. Uh, they are mandates, but the fact is, even in my own hometown of Dayton, Ohio, which almost has full employment at 4.2 percent, what happens when, in fact, every year when these programs continue to go on, even with the best case scenario, the, the 66 food banks that are in my district, they're, they're, on the, they're continuing to increase about 13 to 15 percent every year of people asking for more and more food because the gap between the poor and the rich. So in a way, aren't we passing the buck because we're making the states and local government make that decision because we're taking the mandate off. Now we're saying, you take care of the hungry. And the fact is, they won't be able to, Gary. I, they won't be able to do it. Tony, I don't know. So who I, takes, who has the responsibility? I, for I don't know if we're man taking the mandate off yet or not because we haven't got to welfare reform. And, and, and I'm, I mean, I don't know that they're going to, that this house is going to totally dismantle the food program. I don't know that. But that's exactly. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that will be the case. They might make changes in it, but, that but, is but my we're point. speculating that. that. That's exactly my point. The point is we're putting, we're, we're passing this bill before we know an, exactly what's going to happen with those bills. And but I'm the, thinking this ought to come after the 100 days. Mr. Klinger, we well, the gentleman, to think, respond, and then we have to move on to the other line. I think the, the gentleman from California, Mr. Kahn, has made the point that unless we pass this, unless we give some assurance to states and local governments that, uh, that we're not going to continue to load, load them on with more and more of these things, we're never going to be able to pass any kind of reforms on welfare reform, on health care, or any of these other matters that are going to be uh, done. One, one last question, okay. Jerry. And what's wrong with mandating certain directives on the states and making them pay for it if, in fact, they caused it in the first place. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, uh, that's why we allow the, the waiver to go forward. In other words, this is, you know, stress again that the, the objective here, as much as anything, is to get good, adequate cost assessments of what these things are costing. But clearly, if you have something that is created by the state itself, and the problem is caused by the state, I think it becomes a reasonable thing to pass that through. It would be, have to be done by a vote. It would have to be an up or down vote on whether we do that. So there's no prohibition about doing that. It's just that we have, as a body, we should be accountable for making a decision by an up or down vote as to whether we do it or not. I think you make it more Chair, cumbersome out of this piece of legislation, though. That's the problem. Okay. Let me Mr. yield Chairman, now can I just to make a real, yes, a real brief comment uh, to what Mr. Linder brought up just a minute ago on the three-fifths vote. He asked a question to the chairman, uh, was this uh, brought up in committee? And, and I was going to bring it up in committee as an amendment, and I want the Rules Committee to understand that there is some interest in this occurring, but I was asked to defer to Title III, which you have jurisdiction over, and that's why it wasn't brought up yesterday in the committee. So we deferred it to you, and I still request that you consider that. I didn't entertain any amendments to Title III because of deferring to the jurisdiction. And we, 
we really do appreciate that on behalf of the ranking member and myself. And let me just say that uh, I just made an announcement down on the floor that we will be considering this bill under an open rule so that uh, people are going to have their opportunity and their day on the floor. Let me yield to the gentlelady from uh, Ohio, Mrs. Deborah Price. Thank you, Mr. Solomon, and I welcome my former ranking member from uh, the former Government Operations Committee and, and so many of the other members that we worked uh, hard with uh, last term um, uh, on this very same issue. And I appreciate Mr. Portman's reference to the great state of Ohio as well because uh, our Governor, George Voinovich, has championed this cause across the country, and he's been a wonderful supporter as well as my own local mayor, Greg Lashutka, uh, who did a study some time ago which indicated that the average cost of unfunded uh, mandates to citizens in our city of Columbus, Ohio is $850 per household, and that's a significant amount of money. Um, I'll be very brief, and I only have one question. Um, the threshold figures that we're talking about, whether they're uh, the state and local ones or, or the private um, um, industry ones, are, do they have any geopolitical boundaries at all? Or is it nationwide? Is it, cu is it cumulative total? OK, and the same uh, for the private sector. That's good. That's all I have to, to ask. Thank you very much for your succinct answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No questions. Uh, let me yield to the uh, very distinguished gentleman from Miami, Florida, Mr. Lincoln Diaz Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate very much the presentation of uh, the four uh, the gentlemen who have uh, honored us with their presence today and given us so much uh, useful information on this this legislation, which is long overdue uh, in the state legislature. Uh, we uh, in Florida, some years back, uh, we passed a bill. Of, um, saying that we in the state were not going to uh, uh, send unfunded mandates, require or uh, impose unfunded mandates upon the localities. And uh, I, uh, when uh, Mr. Davis mentioned that uh, this is not a, a partisan issue outside of Washington, D.C., that really uh, struck a chord because in the state legislature, that was not a partisan issue. Uh, in a very bipartisan uh, manner, we came together and uh, said that we weren't going to continue imposing those mandates on the, on the local governments. I have uh, just uh, one question, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, for uh, uh, Chairman Klinger. Uh, I uh, wasn't able to uh, uh, view uh, the meeting yesterday uh, of your committee. Uh, what changes, if any, were, were made yesterday in, in your committee uh, uh, markup uh, from the introduced bill? Let me see. I think the, the major, the only amendments from the introduced bill, there were relatively no changes made, with the one exception, and that was to uh, make it clear that Social Security uh, was not, uh, and, and, and that's right, and court decisions uh, were uh, not involved. So that uh, those were the only changes of any substance. Court decisions, court decisions. Court decisions were involved. Social Security was not. Okay. Well, thank you. Court decisions were, that we made it clear the court decisions were a part of what we were talking about in terms of the unfunded mandate. They are. They this are. would be a court decision that, re, that reinterprets a bill to make it a mandate that would be then be, uh, would be subject to the uh, point of order. Uh, not, not, not. Would be one. Yeah. The commission, which is in Title I would be authorized to look at uh, the court decisions, exactly. existing court decisions. Fine. Thank you very much, and I would yield back. This time. Mr. McGinnis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, to the uh, members of the panel, uh, first of all, I am a supporter of your legislation, but I think that you need to uh, tighten it up. I think that uh, Mr. Frost's comments, uh, at least to me, were most persuasive. I would imagine that Mr. Hall and I probably have a different philosophy on the bill, but I think that what Mr. Frost was saying is, is some language that you should take to heart. Uh, the exceptions concern me greatly. I mean, the constitutional provisions that, it, that if it deals with constitutional rights, uh, it will be exempted from the bill. Uh, to me, it's kind of like, bar uh, as you know, the state of Colorado has uh, four borders, and it's like guarding three of the four borders and leaving the other one completely open. So I. I kind of sensed during the discussion with Mr. Frost that perhaps some of the people in the room may have been a little defensive, um, but I think his suggestions would help the sponsors of the bill, uh, even though I think it's going to hurt Mr. Frost's 
philosophy in the uh, uh, with, with the with the bill in the future. I think it's a hint to us who support it very strongly. Tighten it up. Watch those exceptions. I think, uh, uh, in some disagreement with some, that, for example, the motor voter, although it's retroactive, this may not apply, but uh, you may very well find your purposes defeated on an argument in front of the courts that it did affect the constitutional rights of somebody to vote. So, uh, as I, I look, Rob and Gary, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm very persuaded by your argument, but don't ignore what he's saying. I hope that you take that to heart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Waldholz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to express my appreciation to the panel uh, for your work and that of the other people who have been working on this issue. I'm very supportive of your efforts and of the legislation. Uh, I think this bill is a good means of preventing future unfunded mandates, although I think it's clear that we still have a lot of work to do on current unfunded mandates that this bill does not address. Uh, the only question that I have uh, is one that was raised by another member to me that I didn't have an answer for, and that is the difference in the threshold requirements between state and local governments and private interests. Could you simply address for me why there's a difference, what the rationale was for the different amounts on the threshold requirement? Uh, Mrs. Waldholz, I think the, the reason for that distinction is simply the fact that the Congressional Budget Office has told us that if they have to go down to 50 million for private sector mandates, they will be absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, as you know, there's a distinction uh, with a difference between the public and private. Although the threshold is, is different, there's also a difference in terms of what then happens. On the private sector, it's simply informational. In other words, it's finally going to give us information that we all badly need to, to make decisions on these private sector mandates. On the public side, uh, you then have all of the procedures we've talked about today, the point of order and so on, to be able to stop that mandate or curtail it. Uh, and the Congressional Budget Office, uh, frankly, has told us that if we go to 50 million on the private sector side, uh, they just would not be able to provide the kind of analysis we're looking for. I don't know if Mr. Klinger has a further no, that was, comment on that. It really was more of a procedural problem because the CBO has indicated that the the uh, the Senate has a higher threshold because they didn't get the word that the CBO had indicated they could deal with those at the hundred hundred million dollar level. I think the Senate version has two hundred million dollars. So I think that ultimately we would probably reconcile it at the hundred million. But as Mr. Portman said, this is primarily uh, for the on the private sector and informational, so that we have good figures that we're talking about. Uh, rather than uh, imposing the mandate. Thank you. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming. Um, I would point out that uh, this rule will uh, be on the floor uh, next Thursday, week from Thursday, and uh, you'll be live for debate, uh, and I believe you'll be scheduled for Friday of next week. So we look forward to seeing you there. We thank you for your excellent work on this issue. It is so terribly important. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much for uh, some uh, very uh, illuminating discussion too, but it's a, it's a big problem. Yep. We're going to wait a minute for the stenographer to change his tape here. While the stenographer is changing his tape, perhaps the second panel could come to the, uh, to the table. Do we have all three of you here? Uh, let's see. I certainly hope so. <laughs> Right. Um, the second panel this, uh, this morning uh, consists of uh, Nancy Donaldson, the Director of Political Affairs, uh, Service Employees International Union. We have Jim St. George, the Assistant Director of State Fiscal <coughs> Project Center for Budget Priorities. And we have Greg Whetstone, Director of Legislation, Natural Resource Defense Council. And who is this, the fourth party we have here? Richard Koglin, also with the Center on Budget and Policy oh, Priorities. Right. I apologize. Did you get that? Uh, gentlemen, we apologize for the, uh, having you uh, uh, be delayed in testifying before us, but um, it was uh, an illuminating uh, 
uh, discussion and uh, perhaps it will be as helpful to you as it was to us. So uh, at this point, uh, the first on the panel is, uh, unless you have a choice, I would recognize uh, Nancy Donaldson. I am the Director of Legislation for the Service Employees International Union and on behalf of SEIU's 1.1 million members who work in health care, the public sector and building services, I would like to thank the Chairman for this opportunity to present our views on this important issue. I have submitted a written statement and ask that it be included in the record. Um, Without objection it will be. Shorter. Let me also point out that SEIU is working with a coalition of more than 200 other organizations who are equally concerned about the implications of unfunded mandates legislation like H.R. 5. This coalition is quite broad, encompassing labor unions, consumer groups, civil rights organizations, environmentalists, and others who share a common concern about preserving the power of democratic government to enact and implement protections desired by ordinary Americans. In representing public employees, we bring a unique perspective to this debate. No one knows more than SEIU members about the impact of the ever-tightening fiscal vice around states, counties, and municipalities. Budgetary pressures arising in part because of unfunded mandates have contributed to the loss of some of our members' jobs and benefits. Nevertheless, we believe that unfunded mandates are not inherently wrong. Some mandate, mandates to state and local governments should not be funded by the federal government. Um, and I'm going to talk about an example of that in a moment. I want to emphasize that H.R. 5 will have very real impacts on, very, on people like SEIU members. Many of our members work in the service sector. Our nursing home workers and building service workers start bargaining at the minimum wage. Today, someone working full-time for a year would earn only $8,840, which is about $6,000 below the poverty line for a family of four. A minimum wage increase is long overdue, but H.R. 5 would raise serious barriers to a minimum wage increase. Any increase in the minimum wage would impact state and local government and would therefore be considered an intergovernmental mandate, we believe. Um, there was a member here who asked about the impact on state and locals in this uh, example. In 1985, when uh, the Supreme Court in the Garcia decision extended the Fair Labor Standards Act to state and local governments, at that time the Department of Labor estimated that 260,000 public workers were earning less than the minimum wage, which was then $3.35 uh, uh, an hour. Pardon me, Mr. Chairman. What is that for? How many people? Uh, 260,000 public workers were making less than the minimum wage at that time, which was $3.35. Was that due to the section of the country they were living? Um, I could find that out, but I don't know exactly. That was an estimate that came from the Labor Department. These are public employees. Public employees, yes. Um, what, but year we know, was, we, what year was that? That was in 1985. Uh, we uh, represent a lot of these low-income workers, though. Many of them are janitors uh, and the low, in, lowest uh, level hospital workers, for example. H.R. 5 would require public employers to be compensated by the federal government for the cost of any increase. A raise in the minimum wage would not be enforced in the public sector, or this would mean that private employers would have to uh, pay higher minimum wage, but not public employers. Um, or it would be stopped completely through the uh, provisions if uh, there was not uh, a waiver made. We urge you to exempt from H.R. 5 any federal standards that apply in the private and public sector. We know that many have raised this concern. Second, we urge you to uh, consider health and safety situations. Working Americans face serious hazards in the worst workplace. For example, health workers are facing the resurgence of tuberculosis, which is sweeping through our nation's health care, prison, and social service facilities. Every day, workers in these facilities are exposed to TB infection. To date, at least six workers have died from occupational exposure to TB. OSHA has put promulgation of a TB exposure standard on a fast track in order to cope with this pub public health emergency. Unfortunately, it's in hospitals and prison systems run by state and locals as well as the federal where the TB resurgence is raging. 
A recent study reported that 31 percent of workers in the emergency department at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center training or basic information about TB from their employers. <laughs> Under HR 5, however, the publication of even a proposed rule would be delayed indefinitely as OSHA is forced to conduct behind-the-scenes consultations with state and local governments. Already OSHA standards are subject to a long process of public comment and review. By dragging out this new phase of consultation, public employers at the very least could delay still further promulgation of, of a final standard. Other provisions of HR 5 unnecessarily add to the analyses already required by regulatory agencies like OSHA. In the meantime, more workers would become infected with TB through exposure on the job. Because employers have privileged access to the concerns of employee employers, they will have priority over the concerns of workers. This ultimately is the goal of some proponents, proponents of the unfunded mandates reform, to stall the machinery of government when it acts to protect working people. SEIU strongly objects to these provisions of HR 5, which give a privileged status to employers over workers in rulemaking process. We think that the proposed bill needs to be amended. It is too broad. Several exemptions would remedy this. HR 5 should exempt laws related to the health and safety of workers or which establish or enforce rights of employees vis-a-vis -vis their employer. A second exemption is needed to guarantee fair and equal treatment for private and public sectors. HR 5 should be amended to make clear that it does not cover any mandate that falls also on the private sector. A third exemption is needed to ensure that the proposed bill does not undermine public health. Uh, I was here and I heard the testimony uh, regarding uh, some additional language that Mr. Spratt uh, proposed yesterday, and I have not seen that language. But I would say that we also are quite concerned about the application of this bill to reauthorizations. And we find it inconceivable that the proponents uh, intend to place in jeopardy existing laws, including uh, regulations of child labor, protecting clean air and water, and uh, setting a federal minimum wage. SEIU urges the committee to weigh carefully the far-reaching implications of this bill and to give thorough consideration to the amendments we've suggested. Without these amendments, this legislation will serve only to increase the frustration of ordinary citizens with the ineffectiveness of a federal government so tied in knots by incomprehensible procedures that it cannot enact the simplest protective measures that they demand. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Ms. Donaldson, we thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, if you can stay for the rest of the panel, uh, we'd like to question all of you at the same time, if that's all right with you. Uh, next on the list is Jim St. George of the uh, uh, State Fiscal Project Center of Budget Priorities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity Thank you. Uh, to testify in this legislation. With me is Richard Cohen, a senior fellow at the Center on Budget. Uh, and with your permission, I'd like to have my written statement and an attachment included in the record. Without objection, it will be. Thank you. Much of the research that we undertake at the State Fiscal Project is aimed at improving the fiscal conditions and fiscal structures of states. We believe that it's important to explore policies that will enhance the fiscal stability of state and local governments to ensure that states and localities are able to meet their obligations to low- and middle-income families. Focusing attention on the fiscal impact of fed uh, that federal policies have on state and local governments is a valuable contribution to that effort. There are other, perhaps more significant, causes of fiscal problems uh, in the states and local governments, particularly the threat of cuts as a result of deficit reductions that may dwarf any impact of new mandates that this Congress would impose. At the same time, it is, uh, state and local officials are correct when they assert that the impact of unfunded mandates has grown in recent years and that this change has indeed limited their ability to establish priorities based on local conditions. However, while it's important to address the impact of unfunded mandates, we will suggest changes that could significantly improve this, re this legislation. The House bill should be amended to allow the Rules Committee to play its historic rule role in waiving points of order that unnecessarily obstruct the passage of reasonable and important legislation. Second, 
the private sector cost estimates envisioned in the bill should be limited, as recommended by the Congressional Budget Office last year, to a small number of important bills, the list of which CBO would develop in conjunction with congressional leaders. And thirdly, the charge to the proposed new unfunded mandates commission should be broadened to include an assessment of federal aid and tax advantages uh, available to states and localities to ensure a balance in their report. While we recognize the potential damage that can be done by unfunded mandates, it's important to acknowledge the legitimacy of some unfunded mandates. The value of certain unfunded mandates is implicitly acknowledged by the authors of, of this legislation insofar as they have exempted from its provisions legislation protecting constitutional and civil rights. Although this exemption applies to bills that were once extremely controversial and were attacked because they imposed national standards on states and localities, Today, it's accepted almost universally that the federal government may legitimately impose such unfunded mandates on states and local governments. There are a variety of additional areas where unfunded mandates to impose national standards can also be appropriate, such as employment conditions, safety and health regulations, environmental protection, public safety, education, and so on. Reducing pollution, for an example, is what economists would call a public good. It may not be in any particular state's self-interest to bear the cost of curtailing ac actions that pollute rivers, lakes, or oceans, but it may well be in the national interest for all states to do so. Similarly, it is certainly in the national interest to ensure that children from low-income families receive cost-effective preventive medical care, even though a particular state may not believe it is in its own short-term interest. In those cases, it may require a federal mandate to impose those requirements. Moreover, a simple ban on unfunded mandates would cause serious inequities between the public and private sectors. It is not a, just a public sector union like SEIU that has raised that. The private sector is also concerned about these equity issues. Consider how an increase in the minimum wage that she discussed would affect a public hospital and a private hospital operating in the same city, perhaps even in the same neighborhood. The minimum wage currently applies to both the public and private sectors, so under the provisions of this bill, the federal government would e either have to pay the cost, the incremental cost, for states and localities of a minimum wage increase, or it would exempt them from its provisions. If the public hospital were exempt from the minimum wage increase, while the private hospital were subject to its provisions, the private hospital would be placed at a competitive disadvantage relative to the public hospital. We don't believe that it's the intent of this legislation to put the private sector at a competitive disadvantage. Although it's important to think critically about the impact of federal mandates, it would also be a mistake to view the complex relationship between federal government and state and local governments solely through the prism of unfunded mandates. The federal government also provides significant financial assistance to states and local governments. The list of programs under which federal government currently provides support to state and localities runs for several pages in the budget and would include a wide range of policy areas that are traditionally considered state and local responsibilities, including things like job training, housing programs, juvenile dust justice, crime prevention, transportation, wastewater treatment, and education programs. The federal government also provides substantial subsidy for state and local income and property taxes by allowing such taxes to be deducted in determining federal income tax liability. These tax expenditures reduce the cost of state and local taxes to taxpayers who itemize on their federal returns. Uh, itemize on their federal returns. Periodic suggestions that the federal tax expenditures for state and local taxes should be reduced or limited are met with strong protests from state and local government officials, evidence of their awareness of the subsidy the tax expenditures provide for state and local governments. In 1964, just to put it in some specific context, the tax expenditures associated with state and local taxes amounted to $66 billion, a figure that dwarfs most estimates of the annual cost of all unfunded mandates. That's a substantial advantage that state and local governments receive. Did I say 1994? I apologize. The value to f uh, of federal aid to states and localities, uh, in addition to putting unfunded mandates in its appropriate context, is also relevant to Title I of the bill, which calls for the establishment of a commission to collect data on unfunded mandates. Uh, the proposed commission's assignment is too narrowly drawn, focusing solely on the burdens imposed by the federal government. To ensure balance in the commission's work, its charge should be broadened to include an assessment of federal aid and tax advantages available to states. 
Finally, just a couple of words about the private sector cost estimates in the bill. Um, the bill includes a provision that would require the CBO to estimate the cost to the private sector of any bill whose, sec whose cost to the private sector is estimated to exceed $100 million annually. Due to the difficulty in assessing the cost of private sector mandates, CBO Director Reichauer has testified last year that these estimates are highly speculative, speculative and of dubious value to policymakers. Moreover, the time-consuming analysis could easily delay passage of legislation and could detract, detract from the attention appropriately directed at intergovernmental mandates. As suggested by CBO, private sector cost estimates should be limited to a small number of important bills, the list, list of which would be developed by CBO in conjunction with congressional leaders. I should also point out that CBO authorization in this bill obviously is not an appropriation. They are authorized money to do these studies. The money is not appropriated. By the definition used in this, one could call it an unfunded mandate on CBO. It is not clear that they will be able to accomplish what you intend uh, in this legislation. Finally, it's important to point out that although other versions of unfunded mandate legislation have included important provisions to waive the requirements for full funding of mandates by a simple majority vote, this bill prohibits the Rules Committee from adopting a rule that would waive the funding requirement, as it currently is allowed to waive points of order in most legislation. This proposal would establish profound and potentially unprecedented limits on the rule commit Rules Committee's ability to structure legislative debate and to serve the public interest. The bill should be amended to allow the Rules Committee to play its historic role in waiving points of order that unnecessarily obstruct the passage of important and reasonable legislation. Thank you. I thank the uh, gentleman for his testimony. And uh, let's move on to Greg Whetstone, Director of Legislative Natural Resource Defense Council. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, uh, I am indeed honored to be one of the only three outside individuals to be allowed an opportunity to testify on this uh, sweeping legislation which is moving through Congress so quickly. Uh, I'm here today representing the Natural Resources Defense Council. We are a 170,000 member organization dedicated to the protection of the public health and the environment. NRDC has long stood with state and local officials in support of measures to address their financial concerns, including major new funding programs to help them in their efforts to carry out the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act as recently as last Congress. However, we do not feel that this bill, H.R. 5, is a responsible solution to state and local budget problems, and we reluctantly oppose it. After a careful analysis of this bill, NRDC has joined other environmental organizations in concluding that in its current form, H.R. 5 could undermine important programs, including existing programs, for controlling public health threats associated with governmental pollution. And we urge the members of this committee to look beyond the rhetorical slogans about unfunded mandates to the reality that municipal governments have responsibility for some of our most uh, difficult and dangerous pollution problems, including human sewage, which we may remember used to be simply dumped in rivers before we had that unfunded mandate or partly funded mandate to deal with that problem. Toxic air pollution from incinerators, which is now uh, much more effectively controlled under the Clean Air Act, an unfunded mandate, if you will, and drinking water contamination. <coughs> These federal mandates to which I've referred provide crucially important health protections that will, we fear, be jeopardized under the language in this bill. Uh, we urge the members to preserve these existing laws in an unequivocal fashion. Uh, I have listened to the members on the first panel explain that this bill does not apply to existing laws and mandates. And unfortunately, the language in this bill does not specifically specify that. And I would hope that members on both sides of the aisle would be receptive to a clarifying amendment that unequivocally, unequivocally makes that point clear. This, this is important in a variety of areas, but in particular in the context of environmental laws, 
because many of the landmark environmental laws either are or very soon will be uh, subject to reauthorization. That is, the initial reauthorization periods have expired and the reauthorization is due, either already due, in some cases long overdue, or due in the next year or two. That includes the Clean Air Act, which is up next year, uh, or perhaps the year following, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Water Act, the Resources Conservation and Recovery Act, which deals with hazardous waste. Efforts to deal with these laws and to carry the laws out are crucially important. But unfortunately, the language in this bill as it currently stands would probably uh, provide a lethal point of order under which any member on the floor of the House of the 435 members could effectively veto the legislation, prevent it from going forward. And the, the notion that a Congress which is committed, I know, to ending gridlock should be enacting something that could do so much to promote gridlock is of great concern. We note that if you look at a, a very concrete example, I think something that the members of this committee, I, I, I believe, all supported last Congress were the consensus amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act, which were brought to the floor of the House late in the session with the support of not only the environmental community, but the, the community of water suppliers and state and local governments. As drafted, the bill before the House would have provided vitally important health protections to children and pregnant women and infants, people that are particularly sensitive to drinking water contamination, and done so in a way that would have saved a great deal of money for state and local governments. That bill passed the House overwhelmingly last Congress. However, if that bill were to come up under this legislation, it is uh, and, and our view, as we look at the legislation, there is a very a significant likelihood that it could be blocked by a point of order. And the reason is because in that bill, as in, in my view in any future environmental reauthorization, there are trade-offs. There are significant relaxations and reforms to save money for state and local governments, for example, in monitoring drinking water contamination. But there were some new programs. There was a program to assure that people who operate water treatment facilities for drinking water are adequately trained, something very important, something that was part of the problem that left more than 300,000 people ill in Milwaukee, Wisconsin last year. But that is a mandate. And if the legislation is viewed in terms of are there elements within the legislation that constitute unfunded mandates, then we would find the point of order uh, would lie against the legislation. And the, the key language, just to point out, is in Section 421.7 of the legislation that excludes from the definition of direct cost, cost already being incurred for the same activity. And if the same activity is defined specifically so that, in this case, water treatment operator training, if you will, uh, it was not already mandated, then we'd be in a position uh, where that bill would effectively be able to be blocked, which would be, I think, a very unfortunate thing that members on both sides of the aisle would regret. And we urge members to look also very carefully at the point of order provisions, which, uh, in, in conflict with some of the statements on the first panel, do not allow uh, a majority vote on the floor of the House of Representatives to overcome the objection. What would be necessary, as has been referred to, I believe, by members of this panel earlier, is a second rule. And while the, uh, this panel, I know, is a, uh, a fine deliberative panel, it is by nature uh, a panel that is uh, partisan because it has a high ratio of majority to minority. That's a 9 to 4 ratio. And on the floor, the ratio is, of course, very different. And all members should be given an opportunity to decide if these mandates are worthwhile. So we would also urge that the panel provide a direct opportunity to appeal a point of order on the floor so that all members could participate. Uh, finally, would like to comment a little bit about the timing of the movement of this legislation because uh, this bill has already been reported out of one committee we are grateful for this opportunity to testify, but this is the first occasion 
And having moved so rapidly, this is a complex and sweeping piece of legislation, and we see some very serious problems developed that are uh, apparent now and others that may become apparent if others are given an opportunity to scrutinize this legislation, to look it over, to understand its impact. This applies across the board to all of the different laws that affect how state and local governments operate. And we urge members to provide a little more opportunity for consideration before moving this through. Just to give an example is the on-off switch, if, if you will, for mandates that says that the mandates apply if they're funded. But if the mandates are not funded, then they cease to apply. Now, intuitively, I can see where, well, that may make some sense. But from the standpoint of how are we going to carry out these laws, how is the state or local government going to make a decision? Suppose that the mandate involves installing a treatment facility on an incinerator. Do they make that investment? Do they, do they carry forward and put those pollution control devices in? If they put them in and then the appropriations aren't up to snuff the next year, do they then turn it off? Do they tear the thing down? Are they going to build it back? I mean, there are some very serious questions about how this legislation is going to work. If an amendment is offered on the floor, there was a very interesting discussion earlier. How is the decision going to be made? Whether it's an unfunded mandate, is it a snap decision? Who has responsibility? These are very serious concerns that could end up gumming up floor consideration for bills that uh, you may not initially think have anything to do with unfunded mandates, but that could potentially be construed that way. So we urge the panel to work, please, to clarify the opportunity and provide the opportunity, which is clearly not there now, for a majority vote on the floor and to assure and work with other members to assure that this law truly does not affect existing laws in place now. And we want to, th and, and we want to express our gratitude for the uh, announcement that there will be an open rule on the floor that's very helpful to allow an opportunity to uh, engage in debate and discuss uh, potential changes to the law. And I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify. <clears throat> we, uh, we thank you, gentlemen and lady, for your, your in-depth uh, testimony. Um, just a couple of quick observations. <clears throat> we did not uh, limit uh, this second panel that you were serving on to just the three of you. You were chosen uh, for the most part because you were in opposition or had concerns about the legislation. But uh, there could have been uh, a number of other members and organizations uh, that could have, could have come if they saw fit to. Uh, secondly, um, I mentioned that I do have some concern about the the so-called second rule, because it is cumbersome. Uh, and uh, I have some concerns about the three-fifths uh, proposition being added to it. Um, but I would just point out that uh, there is opportunity to appeal. Uh, if a member were to raise a point of order on the floor, uh, there is always that opportunity to appeal the ruling of the chair. And uh, if it were something uh, terribly significant, uh, then it would certainly uh, have, have a chance. So there is that, uh, uh, that outing. It brings me to the, uh, I think one of the reasons why I am such a strong supporter of this legislation, though, and uh, Mr. Whetstone, you alluded to it when you talked about amendments to the Clean Water Act and the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act. I represent an area which is um, unusual in a state like New York, but it's 10,000 square miles of rural area has mountains on uh, each end uh, uh, of the Hudson Valley in the middle. It's 157 municipalities. There is no city. The largest uh, so-called municipality is a place called Saratoga Springs with 23,000 people. Uh, but most of them are municipalities with less than 4,000, some of them with only 500 in a 100 square mile area. And within that 100 square mile area are little villages. And there may be 100 people in the village, and they have a municipal drinking water supply. And yet, under the, uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, depending on the, on the uh, regulation, they have been mandated to put in tremendously expensive filtration systems, similar to the one that New York City is obligated to, to put in with uh, 8 million people uh, and a tax base to support it. But 100 people in a small village with no tax base at all cannot 
survive with that kind of a mandate. Had this bill been in effect, uh, at least we would have had the cost estimates. This would have been brought out, and maybe this Congress would have, uh, would have considered that when they enacted this kind of uh, legislation. It, and that's why it is so terribly important. We have saddled these people with, with mandate after mandate after mandate, and that's why local government is so concerned. And because of that, and I would just say to, to you, Nancy, the, uh, uh, many of the, of the municipal workers suffer because there is no tax base there to support the other needed uh, areas that, uh, that we have to provide to the people. Mr. Chairman. Let me just finish. Because we have to provide it uh, in the form of, uh, of uh, uh, complying with, with the Safe Drinking Water Act or with the, uh, uh, with the Clean Water Act. So those are the things that we're concerned about. I just wanted to bring that out because I know you are sincere in, in what you are doing, but there's always the other side of the coin, and that's what all of us are so concerned about. Let me yield to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I, I just want to uh, point out that the legislation that was moved forward last time was one in which environmental, environmental community worked closely with, with rural communities, and there were new programs that would, for example, say that if a rural area uh, looked closely and, and evaluated their watershed and looked and made sure that there weren't serious public health threats, that they could use ways of making sure the pollution didn't get in the water, which is much cheaper, rather than having to go through this filtration. And, and I guess the point I, I made earlier that I want to emphasize is, as drafted, this legislation might well prevent a reauthorization bill like last year's from moving forward. And I would urge you to, to support an effort to suggest that you look overall at the legislation. Does it, in the aggregate, produce less of a mandate than was in place before the legislation was reauthorized so that legislation like H.R. 3392 that moved last Congress could do so um, to, and, and not be faced with this point of order. Just to briefly comment in terms of uh, allowing others to testify, um, this all happened uh, very rapidly and I think given a little more time that uh, you might find a, a surprisingly large number of others that are willing to come forward and some people now are just now getting this bill and looking at it and understanding it, and this only became available, I believe, on Friday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, let me at this point yield, yield to no, uh, John Linder, uh, in that case to Tony Bielens of California. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of remarks. First of all, to commend you, sir, on not only on your holding the hearing today, but on, on encouraging and allowing folks such as these to come and, and testify. I find it very troubling, as I'm sure my colleagues on the other side do, that apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, None of you nor any other outside witnesses had an opportunity to testify on the bill when it was before the principal committee? No, that's accurate. Reform in government operations, uh, there was no hearing prior to the markup. That, that, that is worrisome, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, it doesn't fall within our, our realm, but, but it's, a very, it's, it's a very different bill from the one that was introduced and, and moved partly through committee last year um, with all kinds of ramifications that the earlier bill did not have. And it's very troublesome to many of us, I'm sure, that some of the, some of the problems and the questions that these pre people bring up uh, didn't have a chance to be aired in that committee. It may well be that there are adequate answers to them. It certainly is true that uh, an awful lot of our Republican friends, as well as Democratic friends, would be responsive to some of the pro questions that these folks are raising and, and could have and probably would have um, made some changes in the, in the bill when it was in its principal committee the last couple of days which we're not in a position to, to make here. So um, I'm sorry that, that that's occurred. That's not the proper way to, to write legislation around here, as I know our chairman uh, agrees. And I just, I just wish the authorizing committee had somehow done its work in a, in a more cautious and careful and manner, taking a little bit more time than apparently they, uh, they, they did. I mean, that, that is a, that's a frightening proposal, frankly, that uh, our idea that a, that a bill that has so many ramifications as this um, but there was no opportunity for the public and for affected peoples to have an opportunity to, to testify on the bill. I mean, I, f I find that outrageous, to, to put it mildly. All I can say is to our, to our friends from, from the communities who, who were represented here today quite ably before us that, as the chairman announced earlier, and I'm glad to hear it, uh, that apparently we, we will have an opportunity to have an open rule and I can only urge you in the next uh, week or, or less or so to spend some time carefully constructing or coming up with some amendments which would, which would seek to solve some of the problems that you quite properly bring before us today and, and see to it that some members who, 
who feel strongly about these kinds of things have an opportunity to present them on the floor, including Mr. Klinger, who's a very thoughtful and, and sensible and good person, as all of us know, and some of the other Republicans on, on, that, on that committee. I think if some of these problems that you brought up were brought to their attention, in a timely manner, they may well, you may, may well find that they can solve some of these problems for us, perhaps even before we get to the floor. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just say to my, uh, my very good friend from California that uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, this bill would not be reaching the floor uh, until a week from Friday. Uh, it is the intent of this Rules Committee, uh, at the instruction of the, uh, of the Speaker of the House, to abide by the rules of the House, and we are going to give uh, ample time. Uh, we're going to try never to uh, to waive the three-day rule, so the members have ample time to to read the bill, and uh, that doesn't mean that we'll have to we, that we can adhere to it all the time. But uh, we're going to make every effort to Tony, and uh, your marks are well. We appreciate that, Mr. Respected. Chairman. Uh, are there other members uh, that would care to speak on the uh, or to ask questions? Uh, Scott McGinnis of Colorado. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I wasn't going to comment until I read. Uh, the uh, written statements that have been submitted to the record um, by a couple members of the panel. Uh, and I would like to comment on that. First of all, to Mr. Whetstone. Uh, Mr. Whetstone, you make the comment, uh, first of all, it's a little ironic that you use the word rhetoric uh, throughout your statement. In fact, you use the word rhetoric in this sentence. We urge members uh, to step back and look beyond the rhetoric to the reality that without federal mandates, America will return to the days when sewage was dumped into rivers, when toxic air pollution from incinerators was uncontrolled, and when there will be no real limits on drinking water contamination. Then you proceed to go on and say that under this particular proposal, and I wish members of the original panel were here to, to have heard this statement, you say the federal government's hands would be tied as well, leaving no one protect the public health. I think, Mr. Whetstone, that these uh, certainly hurt the credibility of the writing. I think they're gross overstatements. And I think that uh, one of these days, somebody's going to learn that some of us can take care of ourselves in our own states. Can I, can I'd I like to go on. No, I'm not asking a question. I'm just making a comment. Um, and to uh, Ms. Donaldson, in your written comment, uh, make no mistake about it, you say. Some advocates of H.R. 5 and similar legislation intend to sabotage enactment of any law or regulation that benefits working Americans. I used to be the majority leader of the Colorado State House, and I know a little something about working Americans. I got a lot of them in my district, as does everybody else on this panel. I think that's kind of a gross overstatement. And I wanted to give you an example. Um, what the federal mandates have done for the working people of the state of Colorado, frankly, is taken away the choice of the man, uh, the choice of priorities of the people that those working people have elected to represent them at the state level. For example, when we get federal mandates on uh, Medicaid or Medicare or some of these other programs, what we had to do was take money from our education budget to fund programs that we didn't think were necessary but were mandated by the federal government. And it hurt the working people of my area. Another example that I was thinking of when I read your statement here was the, uh, and, and I'm sure the chairman would have similar situation, in our state when we wanted to build a library of which the community in which that library was going to go in was mostly blue collar, mostly, uh, I think any collar is a working person, but mostly blue collar people. And we couldn't build a library because we were mandated by federal government to observe uh, Davis-Bacon because we received a portion, a small portion of the library but enough of a portion to make the difference of whether the library would be built or not, a small portion of it was a federal grant, which required all wages then to go to Davis-Bacon, which meant that the working people of that community didn't get that library. So I hope that you take a step back and take a look at what the impacts are when you take money from the people who have local accountability, from the locally elected officials, uh, when the federal government steps in and mandates that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, so Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, want to commend you on your announcement of an open rule. I think it's a, a, a very good uh, decision to make, especially on a piece of legislation like this that is so complex. I, you know, there are good mandates. There are some bad mandates. There's no question about it. Uh, we've, we've seen them in our states. I, I remember quite a few years ago when we had a river 
in Ohio that caught on fire by itself because there were so many chemicals that were poured into the river. And uh, if it wasn't for the federal government, uh, who knows how long that would have continued. As a matter of fact, they stepped in. It was basically a mandate, and it was a mandate that has occurred around the country in many different places. I think many states probably have stories that they can tell you about that. Today, that river, you can catch the fish out of that river, and they tell me you can eat the fish out of that river. That's how good that mandate absolutely worked. <laughs> but I believe, and some of the statements that you've said are very, very good, that some of these things are in the national interest, medical care, uh, medical care for children and, and uh, food programs, uh, safety programs, employment conditions. Go over again, in, in your opinion, what, how will these programs be jeopardized uh, speaking according for, to this legislation? Uh, yeah, speak, speaking for the, uh, the environmental laws with which I'm most intimately familiar, they, they are due for reauthorization. It is not clear under this language whether in a reauthorization, which would probably include a package of changes, some would be weakening, some would be strengthening. That's the nature of the process. If in such a reauthorization you might look at the legislation and say, well, even though the aggregate burden on state and local governments is, is reduced by a great deal, as in last year's Safe Drinking Water Act amendments, um, there are still some new mandates. For example, the training requirement for people that operate water suppliers, or another is the uh, requirement that they do a, a, a survey, if you will, to assess whether there are threats to the drinking water in their area. And that would allow them to save money by uh, avoiding the necessity for installing expensive treatment technology. But that's a mandate. Well, in the language of this bill, it is uh, unclear and it, whether those new mandates would in fact provide the basis for a point of order and in fact I, I, I read the language that suggests that that's almost certainly the case. And it, moreover, it could be read to say, and I know the authors say this isn't the intent, but once again, let's make it explicit, that if the authorization for an environmental law has lapsed and then you simply come back and you reauthorize, you don't even change anything, just reauthorize, that could well be interpreted as saying, you know, those mandates had run out, and now this is a new mandate, and therefore you can't impose it. And if that's the case, then the whole regime of landmark environmental laws, which really gives us the best environmental protection system in the world, is going to be unwittingly dismantled. And, uh, the, the, I, I would at some point like the opportunity to respond to Mr. Uh, McInnes's uh, statement, comments on my statement, Mr. Chairman. He did not uh, pose a question, but nevertheless, uh, if Tony Hall would like to yield for that purpose. Uh... Go ahead. Yes, I, I'm, I certainly, I wish I'd had the opportunity to uh, present this statement to the, uh, to the other committee on government reform and operations. Um, I, I just want to say that in, in terms of where we would be without unfunded mandates, and, and, and he read the list, I won't repeat it, but it's things like sewage and rivers and toxic emissions from incinerators uncontrolled. That, uh, it, that is not hyperbole. That is history. That is what happened. That is why these mandates were developed. Because without them, we could not effectively deal with these problems, nor with the many other problems in which the way one state acts or one community acts affects the quality of life in a community downwind or downstream. And I, I wish Mr. McKinnis was still here. so. I have the opportunity to engage with him because I think if he stepped back, he would see that this is not hyperbole and, and that maybe when it comes to the basic approach that we're taking, we're not in such uh, disagreement. I would like to also respond to Mr. Hall's um, question. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, uh, as a representative of public employees, we find it incredibly ironic that uh, this Congress and, and the leadership in this Congress that has just applied in, in the House side, of, for example, uh, existing federal laws to the Congress is now talking about exempting uh, state, local uh, governments and counties from having to pay an increase in the minimum wage, for example, because of this bill, which says unless the federal government pays for uh, employees, it won't happen. We also are, uh, the, on the regulatory front, the ability to have secret consultations that are not open to public review on matters such as health 
uh, health and safety of workers in the workplace and to keep that from being applied to public workers if it were applied to uh, private workers is truly <laughs> outrageous and inequitable and this is just the kind of thing that this bill would automatically do. Go ahead. Thank you. Respond to your questions about how specifically this bill might affect legislation. Um, it's always hard to talk about future unfunded mandates since they are by definition issues for which no consensus has yet developed. And yet we all know that problems continue to develop in the country and over time consensus develops over what the solution would be. Just some examples. Education continues to be a problem and, and the uh, occasional failure of school districts to meet their obligation and to prepare students for the next century. Uh, it's also the case that in an increasingly mobile world, uh, it may not be in a particular city or town's interest economically to uh, provide uh, necessarily the full resources available to education. The kids may move out before they receive any economic benefit to it. It may be that that's the sort of thing that over time there will be an increasing consensus. The national economy is at stake unless the federal government takes more of a role in providing education. Uh, uh, additionally, issues like declining wages, it appears to be a problem. Increasing poverty, even during a growing economy when, when uh, uh, unemployment is falling to historic lows, uh, we still seem to need to find ways to respond to the declining wages that low-income workers receive. Uh, Health care, obviously, you all uh, spent enough time last year talking about health care, presumably you're going to again. It again is a case where there may be a public good and a public interest in ensuring preventive care that is not in the narrow interests of any particular state or locality. That may be the sort of uh, unfunded mandate that's important to, uh, uh, to provide. Well, thank you for shedding some light. I, it is a very difficult piece of legislation. I've tried to read it over the weekend and understand it, and it continues to get more difficult as I listen to some of the answers and some of the statements. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. And uh, now I'd uh, yield to Mrs. Uh, Walholtz of Utah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to comment briefly. We've heard a lot about the detrimental impact to various programs that may result if this legislation is passed. But, but I think it's important to note the detrimental impact to positive programs if this legislation is not passed. Uh, five years ago, the state of Utah realized toward the end of its fiscal year that we were going to have a $30 million surplus. And I realized that in Washington, $30 million isn't considered a great deal of money. But believe me, in the state of Utah, that is a great deal of money. We, we decided to divide up that money among programs that had historically been underfunded. The programs were elementary education, assistance for low-income children, assistance for the vulnerable elderly, and other programs that we felt needed assistance and that we were in a position to provide because of this surplus. As we were gleefully dividing up the pot of money, we received notice that we had to come up with $22 million within three months to fund a mandate that this body had decided it was going to impose on the state of Utah. We had no opportunity to decide whether the program that Congress felt was more important was more important than those particular needs that we had decided to make. This body's judgment was substituted for the judgment of the people elected by the people of the state of Utah. So there are detrimental impacts from not passing this legislation that in my view far outweigh any detrimental impact from passing this legislation. I would point out, Mr. Chairman, that this bill does not prevent us from passing unfunded mandates. This bill simply provides that the members of this body have to go on the floor of the House and stand up and be counted if they want to pass an additional mandate. And I think that's a small price to pay for asserting some control over a process that I think has gotten out of control. I thank the, uh, the gentlelady. Uh, let me just make one statement before we, uh, we dismiss everyone. I, I know you have to leave, Nancy, uh, right away. But uh, concerning uh, Section 425, uh, a2, the, uh, on the point of order, and uh, I forget which one had raised that question, but um, there is an agreed to uh, compromise by Klinger and Spratt uh, on that language, and uh, it would be the intention of this uh, committee to, uh, to take that under consideration and probably look favorably on it. If you have any further comment on it, the, uh, the language basically says that uh, uh, Section 425A2 will not apply to a federal intergovernmental mandate 
that would not, number one, increase the direct cost of state and local governments by an amount that exceeds the threshold, i.e., $50 million, or, and this is the agreed to language change, number two, would not reduce or eliminate the amount of authorization of appropriations for federal financial assistance provided to state and local governments for the purpose of complying with the mandate. That's the language that uh, Mr. Spratt had been pursuing, and uh, uh, it seems reasonable. We, we want to discuss it, but uh, and if you don't have any further comment on it, uh, we'll assume that you support that language. Is that? I is would that, feel more comfortable yeah, having I a would, chance to look at it, but um, I know we'll Mr. We'll try to get you copies of it. And we appreciate uh, your interest in really pinning it down because it will make a great difference to us. Right. Well, again, we appreciate your taking the time to come. Uh, your testimony was enlightening, and uh, although I don't agree with all of it, uh, we certainly are always willing to listen in this committee. We, we thank you so much for coming. We will, incidentally, to the other members, convene at 10 a.m. tomorrow uh, to mark up this piece of legislation. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. The House is tentatively scheduled to take up unfunded mandates early next week. The Senate may begin work on its version of the bill as early as tomorrow. Saturday on C-SPAN will have a speech by Senator Edward Kennedy to the National Press Club. He talks about the future of the Democratic Party and other issues in the news. That's Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific Time. Next, Congressional Term Limits. For the next 50 minutes, you'll hear from term limit supporters.